Surprise! Hey, friends and neighbors! We're together! We're in one screen! Isn't this glorious? YouTube's telling people that we're going live. It's all very exciting. It My is. eyebrows are super fierce today. I know, because you did you did your own eyebrows. I think I they did. look great. Don't they look great, everybody? Yeah. They look good. Thank you, this like magic thing from L'Oreal I found on Amazon. <laughs> Whatever, man. It, like your super nice bright light makes my eyebrows look like almost invisible. Does well, Aaron like, have eyebrows? We both got caught we up in that like aughts over, thing of like if they have to be thin. Them. I know the stupid aughts that told us that. I know. So upsetting. And now, like, and nobody told me they wouldn't grow back. <laughs> like, you know, like oh, I don't have any eyebrows. I saw one of the makeup artists. I think the TEDx Chicago lovely lady literally had a stencil. That she yeah. like put over my eye and I was like, you know, it's not a worst idea. It's not a terrible idea. Yeah. No, we should get to I that. need a stencil. We should get to a stencil one of these days. Friends and neighbors, again, after our lovely intro from Eleanor, we've, uh, if you didn't see my live yesterday, shame on you, uh, on the Instagram, just kidding. Um, I know it says we're here to talk about uh, the great resignation. That's a lie. Uh, we're not. We're just going to do some housekeeping and uh, some empathy exercises and jump off because as you could tell from the beginning of this intro, uh, she has no voice. Still. And also, we had to film and produce our own TEDx talk today, y'all. We're going to do probably a GDD about that in February and just tell y'all the story as much as we can of how we ended up producing Dr. Kristen's TEDx Rutgers Camden talk in the factory here uh, in Philadelphia at Abbey Companies. When it is 36 degrees Fahrenheit in an unheated factory. In an unheated factory. It's been a day. It's been a day. It's been a morning. Um, so even before this, yesterday we decided we're like, y'all, we're not doing, we're not doing the GDD. So we'll do some empathy exercises. We've got some GDD uh, updates for the next couple of lives. So that's exciting. And we've got a couple of other things going on, like the fact that y'all can attend Dr. Kristen's TEDx Rutgers Camden talk because it's happening on the YouTubes for free. So we'll share uh, some of those housekeeping updates and then uh, go back to the vocal rest for this one. But we've got some great empathy exercises, so let's get cracking. And hi, Jay, thank you. We will tell you the story, we promise. First up on the list of lists, this is something Dr. Kristen and I heard about as we were going through the COVID times um, and people were experiencing, I don't know what I'm okay. doing with your thing. I will <laughs> there tech. we go. You tech, you tech. Cause I'm like, we're, this normally happens on the other side of the screen. Um, we talked about this. Um, I don't think on this channel, but we certainly did in between the two of us. As we started to hear from our dear online friend, who we don't know, uh, Caroline Criado Perez, who wrote the book Invisible Women and runs the fantastic newsletter now titled Invisible Women, um, that lots of ladies were, lots of folks who menstruate, excuse me, folks who menstruate, were having a hard time uh, with the COVID vaccination. It was impacting their periods and their menstrual cycles and their symptoms and all this jazz. And the uh, shock of no shocks, we didn't know why because they hadn't done any of the testing on the vaccinations uh, considering the impacts of menstruation. I know you're shocked. I know you're all like, what? We didn't. We didn't, y'all. 
Um, so we now know, thanks to uh, recent studies that have been conducted on women's experiences of vaccination and its impact on their menstruation, that 25% of women had a COVID-19 infection reported, a, who had a COVID-19 infection reported a change in their period pattern. Uh, so now, now we're starting to talk about the fact that, you know, the thing that our bodies do once a month, whether we're on some form of birth control or not, uh, can be impacted by infections and medical uh, interventions for that. So now we're asking questions and hopefully having research done about whether it can also impact your ovulation cycle, your PMS, your all of those things that happen only to folks who menstruate and folks who have uteruses. So thanks, science, for belatedly remembering that half the population has a couple of organs that behave differently. All right. From your Indian country correspondent, Avs, I have to cover this one. Uh, the beloved Clyde Bellacourt, who was a leader in the Native American civil rights movement, died at age 85. And we have this great article from BuzzFeed News that highlights the impact that he had. He's one of the co-founders of the American Indian Movement, which started in 1968 out of Minneapolis, um, had a lot to do on the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation, which we know from the more recent water protests. But y'all, shit's been going down in Standing Rock in terms of uh, activism uh, and leading civil rights movements from the indigenous populations on these lands for a long old time. So... I'm not going to tell you what the article says because I want you all to read it and look up some stuff about Clyde. Um, but he is certainly uh, an elder in Native American life and society and culture that will be very much missed for his impact. Numero Trace. This one is courtesy of our beloved fan and subscriber and communicator Nancy H on Twitter. Hi, Nancy. Thanks for sharing this. As I told you in the DM. I'm going to put this in an empathy exercise. Girl, I did. So this one is really, really interesting. And it is the um, announcement that uh, rock singer and performer Elvis Costello made recently that he has retired one of his most famous songs, uh, Oliver's Army, um, because it has a racial epithet in it. And it's a really is scrolling. Yeah, cool. You're it's, doing great. It's a really uh, interesting story because it's also um, uh, set in like about Northern Ireland ish, set in Northern Ireland, a story about Northern Ireland. And neither Dr. Kristen or I had heard of this song, uh, which is interesting. Um, but it has a, 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 a word in it that is very often a racial slur against Black folks. And Costello talked about it and he said, like, this was the word my grandfather used to talk about the British Army. Or that's what he was talk, called. Sorry, that's what his grandfather was called by the British Army as a Catholic. Um, and so it was part of the song and it was part of the storytelling. But now I think this is one of those examples of kind of just rethinking the impact that words have. And we talk a lot about racial slurs here particularly the, in the news recently, um, the changing of names or the not changing of names of sports teams that use racial slurs like the team from Washington or that uh, use stereotypes of native mascots. And so this is kind of one of those falls in the same vein uh, discussions of how we can change things. You know, we can say this song existed, we can say it was contextual, uh, I think a lot of the times the example you and I use is from our beloved White Christmas and the minstrel show song that happens in it. We love that film. We still enjoy that film. We fast forward through the minstrel show song. We know that it exists, that it was part of the cultural context of that time, but it's hella racist, so we leave it alone. Uh, so big salutes, unsurprisingly, to Elvis Costello. I think he's a, a rather inclusive and adept human in the world. So thanks, Nancy, for that. That was a good one. The last one I'm going to cover today is, if you haven't heard of Ava DuVernay's latest, you know, baller enterprise that she's doing, we've got Naomi, which dropped on the CW, I think, last week or the week before, uh, where this 
fantastic 18 year old black lady played by Casey Walfall. Walfall, thank you. Um, is based on a comic book uh, hero and high schooler, Naomi. So uh, this is a really great article in the New York Times about um, kind of the importance of representation of black and brown and indigenous heroes. We also know that um, Marvel has an ongoing series uh, highlighting indigenous superheroes and native writing and storytelling and And also animation. Marvel, Disney, sh we supposedly are getting Miss Marvel on Disney Plus. Right. Like they filmed it. It's so. happening sometime. Yeah. Who knows with the pandemic times continuing. Um, but, you know, we've talked a lot about female comic book characters. We do online and offline because we love comic books. We love superhero stories. We love talking about representation. So I haven't watched any of Naomi yet. Have you? Just some of the like behind the scenes stuff on YouTube. Just I haven't gotten. I'm not great with like, I want something to have at least four episodes. Yeah. You're, you're, I need the full. You don't do the like one episode at a time. I don't thing. care for well, it as much. No, no, I know. No. So um, I'm waiting for this one to have a couple episodes. I've read some of the comics though. Cool. And they're delightful. Nice. So, you know, we may be talking about Naomi again uh, on our YouTube channel, probably not episode by episode, but certainly in terms of representation once we've had a chance to watch it. But shout out to the CW, shout out to Array uh, Film Company, which is the company that produced it, which is run by Ava DuVernay, who's just a badass. If I was at home, you would see behind me my Funko doll of Ava DuVernay because she's a hero of mine. So... Exciting news about uh, Naomi and the CW series. We'll see how it goes. So the final empathy exercise is the excellent news that another gallery has taken the Sackler name off of its walls. Um, for anyone who's joining us who has not watched Dope Sick <laughs> or our coverage of Dope Sick. Um, or I've been on our Twitter lately, um, <laughs> which is like 90% dope sick now. The wow. Sackler family are the inventors of Oxycontin, which is the drug responsible for the most deaths in the opioid epidemic. Um, and it is a complicated drug. The Sacklers are not complicated. They are evil. Um, and for a very, very long time, they used their philanthropy to hide how terrible they are. And they gave billions of dollars to art museums um, and schools all over the place. And a, about a month and a half ago, yeah. the Metropolitan Museum of Art became the first place, high profile place in the country to physically take their names off of galleries. Several places had stopped accepting money. Uh, Yale had, um, the Guggenheim had, but the, the Met was the first place to physically like hammer and chisel, take the name off of the galleries. So the Serpentine Gallery in London now joins that list. They will no longer be called the, the Sackler Wing. It is now Serpentine North instead of Sackler North. Um, and we are very, very pleased with this. The Serpentine Galleries, I can't remember what they hold. I've actually never been there. I've never been there um, either. Um, so I don't know what they hold, but I don't know. I don't know. They're, you know, they hold shit. I don't know. They um, probably, it's British galleries, so it's probably a bunch of stuff. Stuff they, stolen from stuff other places. They stole from um, other places. You really can't like sneeze in London without hitting a museum. So I don't go it, to all of yeah. them. Yeah. And as Patrick Ryden Keith said recently, uh, in talking about um his experience at another British museum, I don't even remember what the it was. Tate, I think it was that it had was the Tate. A, a Sackler wing. You can't really throw a book in London without hitting something named for a Sackler. Yeah. So Again, we hope this is a, an ongoing domino effect from the Met on down to all the other places that have the Sackler uh, name on it, because it's not cool. It's not cool. We specifically in the United States would like to talk about the universities that still have their name too, especially most of the Ivies. So um, at your leisure, Yale and Harvard, at your leisure. Whenever you guys want. And, you know, naming of buildings is, is you know, the way that, that people are recognized for donations that they make. Um, and so that's how the Sacklers, they used a hell of a lot of money that they made off of the manufacturing and selling of- I mean, it's essentially, it's cotton. essentially like it's white upper class money laundering. 
Yeah. Like philanthropy is money laundering in some very real ways. And there's yeah. been some great coverage in by investigative journalists recently about the legacy of large scale philanthropy, not charity work. Philanthropy is like large gifts of money yeah. and endowments, things like that, and how those have been used to money launder in a lot of ways. Um, anything that anytime BP, for instance, does an energy, BP or Exxon yeah. have like, you know, global warming things. It's just money laundering. It's money laundering. Yeah. And as, as Kristen pointed out, it's really important to remember that this was an intentional part of the Sacklers kind of marketing strategy yep. to keep people away from noticing what was happening with Oxycontin. Um, and to keep positive attention on them. So it was a big way to combat any negative stories that might've come out, especially uh, in like the late nineties and into the two thousands during the first few cases, federal cases that were made against Purdue Pharma um, and the Sacklers being uh, the, the owners of Purdue. Um, a lot of people went after Purdue and didn't quite realize the level of uh, involvement that the Sacklers had in making those decisions that were being made at Purdue Pharma. Because in 2002, they removed themselves from a lot of the decision-making apparatus, intentionally so. So that they weren't, um, so that they weren't held accountable in that way. Wow. Um, sorry, guys. We found you. <laughs> sorry, we found you. Yeah. And it's been really interesting as, as we talk about Dope Sick and um, we're going to be covering as soon as this chicken's voice recovers uh, a netflix docuseries the pharmacist where we learned that like every time there's a case about purdue and oxycontin we get more documents right because they can request more emails and letters and you know files on in marketing you know platforms or paraphernalia or whatever um neither of those two p words were the words i was looking for but whatever um marketing materials the ephemera ephemera maybe uh as we get all these documents we learn more and more about uh the straight up evil of the sacklers so again saluting the serpentine galleries everybody else we await your decisions okay housekeeping announcements announcement number one is that you guys know if you're watching this live or replay crew hi that we haven't been doing gdds this month so far because of said voice and the need to produce a TEDx talk. But we've done special GDD episodes on the podcast because if you do or don't know, the episode on the video we do on Tuesday um, ends up as a podcast episode the following Wednesday. But we have a couple special episodes. So if you've been missing our GDDs uh, and you wanna see what the what the what we've done uh, on the podcast episodes, you can go back on the culture cast and find those on any of your podcasters that was episode that was announcement number one announcement number two we will be back next week regardless of this one's voice because we have uh yet another edition of our covid on college campuses update our continuing conversation with our friend and colleague cheryl west young about the work that she is doing and her students are doing in terms of uh, awareness and recognition uh, of COVID-19. They did a fantastic memorial service uh, for people who have died or who have lost folks from COVID uh, last year on campus, which she talked a little bit about the last time she was here in December to update us on also the work they did in terms of um, getting college students vaccinated and awareness about vaccines on college campuses. So she will be back along with some of her students there's going to be a performative element. They're going to share some of the stuff that they did for the COVID memorial service. So that will be next Tuesday, the 25th, the 25th at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So if you've joined the other ones with Cheryl, especially you, you won't want to miss this one. It's going to be really good. And I think we try and provide space for grief and healing uh, as we go through these periods in our lives. And so that's certainly what the next Good Doctor's Diagnose is going to be. The Good Doctor's Diagnose following that, if if you uh, caught the live uh, yesterday, you already know this. If not, surprise, we're bringing back our dear, dear friend, Dr. Nadine Thornhill, who has joined us for Handmaid's Tale coverage and also uh, trauma and grief in WandaVision on the, good, on the Good Doctor's Diagnose. So Nadine is coming back to join us to talk about Disney's 
Encanto, which we watched Saturday night, uh, alternately uh, overjoyed and uh, personally attacked, <laughs> sobbing our way through. Uh, Hi, my name is Luis. How are you? <laughs> Particularly uh, the song service pressure, we had to pause it a couple times. I literally had to walk. It was like it was like punching Dr. Kristen in the face with accuracy. So thanks, thanks Lynn. Lynn. Thanks Lynn? Question mark. Um, so anyway, we loved Encanto. We had seen on Twitter that Nadine was talking about it. She loved it as well. It's got fantastic themes about family and communal trauma and intergenerational relationships and community building and really, really rich conversations um, that are both specific to the Colombian folklore story that it's telling, but also universal. Um, and the best pieces of art are both specific and universal. And universal. So we'll be talking about all that and more with Nadine on February 1st, Tuesday, February 1st. Y'all, it's going to be so good. I can't wait to talk about it. It's going to give us the excuse to watch Encanto like three more times before then. Uh, so be sure to join it. Jay um, <laughs> is scared to watch it because you keep hearing stuff like this. It's so good. Girl, it's so worth it. Girl, it's good. It's but so like have it. a glass of vino or or adult beverage. With, and have us on the text. Uh, with you or some cookies. We had cookies, right? We had cookies. We had cookies. No adult beverages, but tea and cookies. Uh, and it was very comforting. Yeah. I mean, it's still like, it's a great, it, it's a Lin-Manuel Miranda musical. Like, it's still <laughs> a ton of fun. Like, the house talks. I mean, like, cool. essentially, it's it's like, we have a Colombian Jarvis, Jay. Like, you need to watch it. So, um, no. A it's, Colombian folklore jar Jarvis. A Colombian folklore Jarvis. It's, it's gorgeous. It's really great. And uh, we do need to talk about Bruno, which we can't wait to talk about in a couple weeks with Nadine. And in the name of every deity that we know, by the 8th of February, my voice will be back. <laughs> I don't know what we'll be talking about by then. Um but those are our GDD announcements to make. That's very exciting. Other announcements to make. Uh, so Dr. Kristen was supposed to give a TEDx this week at uh, Rutgers Camden in live and in person. Um, but, you know, Omic COVID. Omicron had other thoughts and feelings about that. So the organizers have postponed, both postponed the event and made it entirely pre-recorded on the YouTubes. So that's what we were doing today, pre-recording and producing said TEDx. Thank you so much out loud to our dear friends, Trisha Brooke and Eleanor, our, our team member, Eleanor, for all the handholding they had to do as the two, as Kristen said yesterday in a meeting, the two least technically adept members of the Abbey research team trying to produce a TED talk. So many stories, y'all. So many stories. Uh, so any who's a what's it, we will share the link in the show notes for this. It's February 5th, y'all, and you can come wherever you are in the world. So our friends from around the contiguous United States and North America, Omar in France, if you watch this, hi, Omar, you can watch her TED Talk live. Uh, it's, we don't know what time it's at. Noon, Noon, I think. They're starting it. Um, but then they'll live on the YouTubes as well. And you can, you know, watch it back if you're busy that Saturday. Uh, so we'll make sure and share the link. But it's super exciting because I know how much our community gets invested in this this wonderful human's ability to tell stories in, in red circles. Should we tell them the title? Tell them the title. Yeah. So the title is Everyone's Replaceable and Other Lies We Live By. Yeah, so it's all about um, incorporating a lot of philosophies that our parent company, through the running uh, with Kristen's family, have uh, evolved and developed about running small businesses and how to treat humans like humans instead of widgets. It sounds revolutionary, and it actually is, which is why she's giving a TED Talk about it. And she won't be in a red circle or a red dot, but she does have a red door behind her, so it counts. It counts. It counts. It counts. All right. Final announcement. At the end of February, we have something very exciting coming um, that, you know, we will work on one of these days. No, just kidding. We are working on it all the time. Uh, we are hosting a the first of our 
two times per year, biannually, biannually, that's the word. Yep. Uh, Empathy 101 Masterclass. It is a two day online Zoom event. Again, friends from all over the world, you can join us. We will have two full days of basically everything we teach about empathy uh, into our core buckets of uh, real and authentic inclusivity, how to deal with trauma, how to handle exhaustion, how all of those buckets move and work together uh, to help us build our empathy practice. We also have a very special guest coming. We have two, actually. Two special guests. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Two special guests. So the first one is a lovely and incredible woman named Crystal Fox, who hosts the podcast Crystal, uh, Crystal Ball Clarity of It All. And Crystal's going to be talking to us about her fertility journey and the trauma of that. And not only the trauma to her body, but what trauma felt like and looked like in trying to navigate a multiple failed pregnancy situation with her family who didn't really understand. And she has been talking about it and on the podcast a lot and has agreed to come and talk about it on the masterclass and answer questions and have conversations about trauma. Our second guest is a um, wonderful and incredible speaker and fellow member of Trisha Brooks community, Amelia Felbinger, who um, is a professional actress and brings the tools of an actor's ability to be present in like their character to help us to be present in our humanity. Mm -hmm. And she's going to help us close out the masterclass. Um, I have no idea how many more times Amelia and Crystal are ever going to be able to join us again. So you don't want to miss them, even though we'll be back doing this in September. I don't know if they're going to be able to join us. Yeah. So you definitely want to join us on February 24th and 25th on Zoom. On Zoom. So we will have the link below if you would like more information on how to register how to get involved if you register anytime between now and january 31st you get a early bird price of 14.97 us dollars otherwise it's 19.97 us dollars for two days with us all the stuff all the resources a wonderful community of folks to learn from and have discussions with um, plus our wonderful guests of Crystal and Amelia. So you really, we would love to have you. We love you guys. We love talking to you. We love having conversations and learning with you. So please join us. The links will be below. Last time, that is February 24th and 25th on the Zoom. So we can all be in our pajamas and have mugs of tea and just shoot the shit for a couple days about what we've learned about empathy and what we think you need to know. So all those links will be in the show notes. I think that's all our housekeeping. Yeah. yeah. We don't have any more crazy announcements. No. I don't think so. No more TED Talks. No more TED Talks coming up that we know of Yeah, I have not applied to another single one. Thank you very much. I'm taking a break. <laughs> so well-deserved break. We will actually be celebrating our 10-year friend anniversary. That's right. Y'all. Uh after after we talk to Nadine, yeah, after yeah. we talk to Nadine. So uh, the first weekend of February, we're going to a lovely spa and historic in... In the Brandywine Valley. In the Brandywine Valley in Delaware. Oh, I've never been to the state of Delaware. She tells me it's not very exciting, but I just want to scratch it off my scratch. I'm like, that's where we go back to school shopping because there's no sales tax. So I'm <laughs> also excited for this reframe of Delaware. Yeah. The childlike joy that I will experience. She's like, we're going to Delaware. I was like, I drive. Oh, I was like, I drive through Delaware to get to Baltimore. Like, okay, cool. But but I have been keeping track of the U.S. states I have visited for oh, 20 years. Okay. Oh, like a long time, ever since I was a kid. Because I used to drive a lot of places with my family. So I ticked off a lot of states pretty quickly. Like if you drive between Colorado and Pennsylvania, you can hit like 10 states pretty easily. And I've been stuck on this same number for a long time. So this so year. It is a big deal because I have been stuck at like 27 or whatever okay. for like a long ass time. Because it's basically the South, the upper Midwest, and the Pacific Northwest, and then some of the Northeast. Like two or three things in the Northeast. The last one I did was Maine, I guess. The new one was Maine. And that was 2016. So we'll get our Delaware and Louisiana this year. Stay tuned for details about why we're going to Louisiana. Friends in New Orleans, you can come see us if you want. Um, yeah, so sorry for that tangent, but that is the other exciting thing we have going, and we are going to rest, y'all. We're going to rest. 
it's possible. We can accomplish this thing. Yes. <laughs> we, we can. Rest looks differently for everybody. So we will be accommodating and inclusive in our resting. I think I've already read 30 books this year because I haven't been able to talk. Yes. So on that note, we thank you for joining us uh, either live, our dear beloved Jay, or on the replay crew. Um, and, you know, make sure and check the updated show notes for all the links for all the stuff we talked about, including our empathy exercises. And we will see you live next week. With on Cheryl Tuesday. and students. Yeah. Bye. Bye.